right, hi everyone, come on in. I'm Seth Parker Woods, cellist, um, soloist, chamber musician, educator, curator, I do a bunch of things. Um, I guess I'll just kind of keep waiting for people to come on in um, with your questions. It could be um, regarding playing, it could be regarding shifting, it could be regarding just tonal production without tired, fully tiring yourself out to get a very strong, what some people sometimes call professional tones. Um, uh, let's see, other things, really looking at vibrato, different forms of that, different types of weight, weight especially in the thumb position or in the lower positions, um, making sure you're looking out for kind of reducing tensions, um, different versions of the same, different versions of bones for the same phrase, being able to kind of control it in that way. Um, exercises we can talk about. Um, yeah. I'll wait for you guys to come on in here. Oh, and hi from New York and happy Easter for everybody celebrating today. Also on Sunday, it's kind of lazy Sunday here for everybody. Um, yeah. So I guess we already have our first question from, uh, from Peter. Teaching is an integral part of a musician's career. How do you begin and develop your pedagogical skills and how have they evolved over time? Wow, yeah, so I kind of, I guess the first early versions of my kind of pedagogical training uh, came while I was in my master's degree. Um, maybe it was my bachelor's, I can't remember exactly. But um, I had started kind of giving preparatory lessons in this point in time and just watching a lot of other teachers, um, talking with my teacher specifically at the time about kind of his approaches and how they have evolved over time, what things you keep from your, your teachers or people you play for in master classes, things you learn along the way that can be applied down the road. Some things may fall by the wayside or you take fragments of them. Um, and I guess at a certain point for me, um, I really started to figure out, so okay, certain things work for my teachers or work for certain cellists or for, for certain musicians. Um, so I started to kind of experiment. I, is, basically the easiest way to say it to figure out exactly what is truly working what where are the weak spots uh, where I know that more growth can can come and can happen over time um, and try to kind of find ways to kind of focus in on those things a little bit day after day in each practice session and sometimes you know you're not focusing all the time and then a biggest part of that is really just looking at other musicians that you're teaching or musicians that you're working with um, or you're playing alongside of, maybe even an orchestra. And some people I've seen nowadays, now in the day of social media, people are, I'm always seeing on like Instagram or um, in the Cello International Cello Society questions that are popping up. And of course we get a barrage of a long thread of people <laughs> with different perspectives and ways. So, you know, there, and I think that's one of the beautiful things because there's no one way in which to play the cello and one way in which to teach. Of course, there are what we can call fundamentals or the be a bed a bedrock of uh, cello playing which evolves over time um, and I think for that um, I've just kind of pieced it together in a way certain things have come during my time living in Europe and studying there and seeing just how differently a lot of the cellists play especially when you're not looking at modern instruments uh, but you're looking at um, early musicians, Renaissance musicians, Baroque musicians, and how they come to how they come to the bow and playing with the bow. And I always thinking for me, the, the, the bow is almost like the tongue within the mouth and having a wide palette for that. Not necessarily always having to play down here, of course, I think this is a good starting point, but how can you move out um, even in underhand playing it, using that type of bow holder approach to a wide variety of music and what that can do for new colors that you didn't know were there and new forms of control um, and balance, yeah. So it's, it's really, for me, it definitely has evolved um, and it's like in a very exciting way and I'm constantly on the lookout for new method books that are coming out and like what's coming out from that and if, if it's applicable or if I find that it, it really is useful um, for kind of where I'm at and where my students are at this moment in time. Sorry for all of this <laughs> street noise. Welcome to New York City. 
Uh, so hopefully that answered a little bit of your question. Um, from Karma Ayala, what is your primary focus when preparing for your performances and how does it change as you get closer to the performance? Well, first up, I think for me, a large part of that really is just getting the, the score, especially if it's new music, if it's a work I've never played before, it's really just trying to get a handle on the bare bones, the structure of it, what, what the composer is actually asking and trying to say their story, that narrative, and then also then in putting myself inside of it. So a lot of part of that, of course, the rhythms, the intonation, the phrasing, phrasing patterns, beat patterns, uh, harmonic structure are all things, colors, tone, um, how that can evolve over time in different forms of bowings. Always trying to have like a, a what I call kind of tour ready uh, performance method in a way, if anything happens, I have at least one or two fingerings or bowings that I know can kind of fall on to make it work in, in performance. Because you just never, of course, you just never know what will happen on the stage sometimes. Um, and as I get closer to the, to the performance, um, for me, it just becomes whether, well, it depends if it's either solo or in chamber music based settings. Um, really getting it to the point where I'm, it, I'm actually embodying that performance, being able to kind of go through it and see what sticks, uh, what doesn't stick, what needs a little bit of finessing, <laughs> and kind of where, if there are blockages, exactly being able to kind of analyze those things and figure out exactly what is getting in the way there and how to be able to work around those things. Um, yeah. Question from Matthew Williams, the second. Hello. Um, do you have any tips on the Lalo Concerto, especially in the introduction? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, tips, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, well, let's see. There's a lot there. <laughs> There's already a lot there. Um, uh, I guess the first big thing is character. It's always a first thing for me, regardless of the technical side of things, which is important as well, letting the, the technique serve the music and, and serve kind of where you're trying to go and where Lalo himself is trying to get the performer and the listener to go. Um, it's understanding kind of, one, your phrase structure is also two, um, where, where are the apexes? Where are kind of the goalposts for yourself? Um, even in the first notes, your very, very first notes, um, what is it you're trying to convey? How much energy do you need to expend? So that, that, that idea, so... The, are you... What is the first G for you? What, what does that mean for you? Where are you trying to go with that? Um, I think a lot of people, they just jump right in and it's fiery, but why is it fiery? <laughs> And where, where, what do you envision this whole, what I like to think of as almost like a recitative in a way. What are you thinking of it as? Um, another side of things is for the Lalo specifically, but I think this can be applicable for a lot of rep, um, regardless if it's old or it's new or very new <laughs> as in the last week written or something, um, is sometimes you have a specific technique and it's, you're practicing it in a very specific way, probably way under tempo. And then you come to performance, even if you're ticking it up on the metronome, sometimes you can lighten up, finding ways that it, not everything has to be so muscular all the time, but being eventually finding a way. And as I get older, I learn this more and more is trying to find ease, ease in playing. Of course, there are certain things that, that are going to just take a lot more muscle, a lot more full body strength or lower body strength to kind of propel you forward, to keep you, to sustain you through a performance. Um, but really thinking, how can you play with a little bit more ease in a lot of these passages? So not, not everything, especially in articulations or, or big runs um, that are either idiomatic or not idiomatic, um, figuring out what is it to do it in with the with the weight you're not normally practicing it in, and then also the weight that would be the, the performance weight for those things. So maybe uh, the touch is actually much lighter, so you can actually be able to move through the material um, more quickly and with with more ease. Um, Christian Lewis, um, could you talk about what it's like working with? <laughs> Yeah, could you talk about what it was like working with Sting and share more about that performance? Um, okay, wow. Okay, yeah, so there's a few things here, and then I'll talk about the album. 
my album, my very first album. Now working on my next one, kind of well long overdue. So, um, so with Sting at the time, I was a cellist with um, something with the um, Orchestra of St. Luke's here in New York City, which has been around for quite a long time, um, and I've just been such a big fan of the orchestra, and I've been playing quite a few concerts at this point. Um, this is well over a decade ago now. <laughs> Uh, but this was absolutely quite amazing. Um, that performance, I think this was for the, he and his wife, uh, Trudy Styler, they do a Save the Rainforest Gala every, I think pretty much every year in normal times or in the before times. Um, and it's always a slew of guests that are invited and artists and philanthropists and activists, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are invited for this. And so there's a big kind of, creative artistic uh, concert that actually happens. And I just remember the very first rehearsal and I've known quite a lot of people that have worked with him in the past on previous albums and just mentioned how great he was. And I remember my very first rehearsal um, with the orchestra and we have like a band break and then he comes over <laughs> to, to me. I hadn't said anything. He comes over to me and he just, just tells me, oh, I play the bass. And I'm like, well, I play the cello. So <laughs> a little different. But he asks, could he, um, could he just borrow my cello for a second? So then after that, he starts out pizzicatoing the, um, the opening prelude of the G major box. That was really cool that he like adds a few extra chords in there. So he's just, he's just like the musician's musician, just a consummate player, really great attitude. The process of working with him and performing with him on a few different occasions was always really great. The same thing with like Peter Gabriel as well. With Peter, I toured for a lot longer in those years. Um, but Sting was just, just a brilliant, brilliant person and musician, of course, amazing singer as well. Um, we just had a great time and just, you know, there's sometimes you have performance regardless of genre or area medium. Um, that are really there to help others shine and make sure everyone can see the best of themselves. And I think he's very much so one of those people that's not fully always about performative egos, but more so just um, trying to, you know, be the best musician they can in that moment and be and be a facilitator for the for those that are also around them. So that's a great trait for just people in general. And I suggest Hope, hope most people are trying to kind of follow in some form of kind of humanitarian way in that same way. Um, so trying to elevate others while also lifting yourself up at the same time. Yeah. But a lot of fun with Sting, touring with him, performing with him. Um, for my album, what was the inspiration and process behind a, your single words and not enough um, album? So that album, which came out in 2016, 2017, it's been a while. Um, um, that, um, that was a multi-year process of just the development of the work. The title track comes from a work called A Single Word Is Not Enough, Three in Variant by Pierre-Alexandre Tremblay. He's a Quebecois composer based in the UK, um, where I first met him when I was, I was living and studying in Basel at the time when I was studying, uh, with the cellist Thomas Demenga and Lucas Fels from the Arditi Quartet. Um, again, a long time, <laughs> some time ago, um, but, um, it was there. I had kind of very, I kind of started working on a few of the pieces that would eventually become part of the album. And I kind of struggled back and forth. Do I put out a fully classical album as the first album anyone ever hears of me as like a, an archive commercial recording, or do I do, do something about where I'm at right now? And all lines kept pushing towards that, towards kind of putting out with where I'm at right now and uh, trying to put something new forward. I had a, a late pedagogue and teacher. Um, that's the same thing, actually. Sorry, <laughs> mentor and pedagogue. Um, the late uh, Andre Emilianoff, who taught at the Juilliard School for a long time and long-standing member of the De Capo Chamber Players, who really pushed me in the world of kind of trying to play everything, trying to play as much as I possibly could possibly could, especially the music of now or, or at that time, um, playing composers that are living now uh, and trying to tell their stories and tell your stories along with them. Because I always ask, you know, even with um, younger musicians, or older musicians, you know, how do you see yourself in 
in the Bach suites? How do you see yourself in the Brahms and the Beethoven and the Schumann and the Rachmaninoff and, and so on and so on and so on? Um, you know, when these pieces are written well, <laughs> centuries before you existed, where do you see yourself in them? So for me, this album in many ways represented kind of where I had arrived to in this moment in time as a way of investigating movement, investigating translation. I spend a lot of time studying musicians, archiving the, the movement and physicality of musicians as a way of better understanding how they move, more specifically why they move in such ways. Um, when playing in a wide variety of um, repertoire, we call kind of case studies of uh, Baroque music, classical music, contemporary music, and studying a wide variety of both, um, both cellists, harpists, dancers, pianists, um, percussionist, so kind of musicians with outward facing kind of movement, not necessarily like an oboe or clarinet where the movement is constricted to one specific area or kind of quadrant. Um, so a lot of those works kind of came out of this studying and development of self, studying and development of musicians. So it's kind of like the musician's musician study. Um, and looking at a variety of different types of sounds and techniques that I could work on developing with these composers. Um, a lot of them looking at translations that are inspired by um, visual art, others where I am also speaking and playing. And this is kind of my first early sojourn in this area. The, the, a few years prior to that as well, I kind of first started when I was living in Switzerland. Um, and that kind of developed a little more up into this point. So in a way, it's like turning a mirror on oneself and I'm just showing different um, shards of myself across this album um, that use electronics that extend uh, the voice of the cello in interesting ways through electronic means. Uh, and it's a really amazing album. The weird and interesting thing that I'll never do again, I recorded that entire album in uh, I think two or three days and I had just gotten my doctorate I think three days before the <laughs> before I started recording. So it was a really crazy week. Um, and so I'll never do that kind of process. It'll take a lot more time to record and develop the music. Um, but yeah, we, we recorded all of it. Then there was a whole editing process, but that's a lot of music to record in a short period of time like that. But I really, um, I really enjoyed that. So, so there's inspirations from Jean-Michel Basquiat, the famed artist um, that, that's in one of the works by Edward Hamill. Um, a Single Word Is Not Enough 3, which is Pierre Alexandre Tremblay's work. Um, that one comes directly um, out of a translation of an earlier work of his. Um, this is the third in a series, but this one um, came, that draws more heavily from his very first, just purely electronic work. So how do we take an existing work that's purely electronic and translating some of the material now for an acoustic instrument to be able to play. So a lot of playing around and trying to figure out how to make the sounds or the, the, the melody or the structure, and then the harder part, how to notate it in, not, in a way that is becomes very universal and it's not weird symbols, but uh, notation that looks, that is, well, in, in short, universal, that any cellist that would come to the work after me would be able to also play it. So that was very important that it has a long lineage. Uh, that doesn't stop with me. That's not kind of artist spec design for a specific cellist. There are certain things that are inspired by my playing, but other parts of it allow for any cellist to kind of come to the stand and be able to play it. Um, yeah, and that's, so that's kind of the short process of it. I'd love to talk more about it, but it was a lot of fun working on that. And it's been um, an amazing journey. Um, let's see, uh, from Jakob Mitterer, uh, I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, could you give us any thoughts on how we can adapt fast to different conditions? Oh, wait, can adapt fast to different conditions and sizes of concert halls and rooms? Since we play mostly in our living rooms these days, very true. I felt like that I've lost this, the feeling uh, for bigger rooms when I had the possibility uh, to perform in, a, in bigger rooms lately. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so this is a, a big one. So this is something. Um, there's a saying of, you know, trying to be able to like, in, in, envision you are sending your sound to the top rafters of a hall. Sometimes the hall doesn't have, you know, <laughs> multi multiple um, levels. Sometimes it's just, it's just one level or two levels. But for me, the idea is, 
again, going back to this idea of ease, because every hall is a little different. And sometimes we don't love everything about each 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 one of them. Um, and sometimes it's not necessarily always trying to create a huge, big sound, but more of a forward uh, facing directional sound that actually can fill out where you you yourself also feel that sound that both kind of especially if you're playing with orchestra or your your solo recitalist or your recitalist in, in a duo setting um, so for me I think right now at home I'm looking at this because I've had to go play a few concerti in these past few months and it was definitely jarring coming back to the hall so trying to get back into that in that kind of shape I should say um, so part of it really was one, trying to play as soft as I could and figuring out how can I create the sound so that it spins, as we call it in that way, uh, that there is an oscillation of sound in the... So I think part of that is the starting of notes, just as I talked about in the lalo, regardless of the rhythm, but... sound that is there so I think part of the thing right now while you're working in living rooms is feeling as if you're not practicing for the living room or you're not like oh I'm here so this is all I have so I'll just keep it quiet but how can you push further is it not necessarily having to go to the bridge but maybe you're still like in the ordinario area the middle the middle ground before the the, the, um, the fingerboard um, or even there so how can I push the sound forward so a lot a lot of times it's just me practicing and just doing long tones or doing just thirds, fifths, and figuring out how I can, how I feel the sound. Maybe I'm putting too much weight, like pronating into the first finger. Sometimes I'm, I need to balance more and put more weight actually into the, um, into the fourth finger so that I'm actually balancing out and I'm extending so that the sound I have at the heel is the same sound I have at the tip. Um, so that same idea. That, So you're not, you're not necessarily crescendoing uh, through anything initially, but it's just trying to set your core and figuring out where sound starts to fray in a way that you're not forcing too much, making sure that you're pulling from here. You're also pulling from the elbow as well. Not everything needs to be in the wrist. And of course, you can't play all every single piece in with using utilizing only your wrist, but uh, being able to use that, maybe using your fingers, isolations, or bringing in a composite of a few different areas of the arm for also your core, your seat. Are you holding tension there? Can you release in that way? There's a great cellist and colleague of mine, Seyan Bofrostatia, um, an Icelandic cellist based in Seattle at the University of Washington there. She plays on this like yoga ball. And it, <laughs> it's amazing because it really helps release tension in a way that allows you to kind of redirect that sound, redirect the energy and the weight where you're not holding in one place where you can actually be relaxing. So finding out one, uh, where your balance, I guess, anchoring of, of, of body and weight is and how you can utilize that in actual, in actual context, even the... The same idea. idea there uh, if you're looking at just even shifts for halls sometimes they change um, so just for me dreaming about like maybe I don't have to push so much some halls just immediately just take the sound and I don't have to do anything or I don't have to push so much I remember I was in Atlanta um, with the symphony back in this past December for the first time playing with them and um, in that hall, I don't have, I didn't, I, I was like, oh, I feel like I have to push more, you know, and then I got on the uh, the phone with the um, the engineer and they were saying, oh no, you, you're, you're actually coming through too well at this point now, you can, you can lay back some, so in that way I can just focus on pulling back and just enjoying where I'm at instead of feeling as if I have to push beyond the orchestra um, in that way so I can lean back. So what does it feel to play in a very normal, you know, normal way? Um, where I'm not pushing so much, but the balance is there. And sometimes I even push, literally, I push into the fourth finger to put a bit more weight and um, anchoring into the bow in that way so that I know that um, I'm, 
I'm going to get a, a good directionality for the sound, especially in the lower part here, the... So if I did that with just the first finger, you get that, but if I push more, or I'm more conscientious of the fourth finger, and it's not like you're pressing in, but you're just, you're just adding a bit of weight here, you know, a bit of weight here. So for me, that tends to work a lot. So I think working on small passage work, working on things you know that you may need to speak a little bit more, but not necessarily always feeling as if you need to push, 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 but feeling as if you also want to bring the audience in in a way. So sometimes pulling back a little bit in a way. So it doesn't always have to be so like a cannon ah, uh, right into the audience. Feel as if you can also bring the audience in a way and make them you know, feel it. That doesn't mean do a subito pianissimo <laughs> in the middle of a phrase, but really think about weight, think about directionality of like, is this actually going in the direction that I'm wanting it to? Um, if it's not, what do I need to adjust? Is it height? Is it is it uh, something that deals with the wrist? Is it the fingers? Is it the elbow? Is it am I holding tension somewhere? Is it in the hips? Is it in the heel? Is it in the in the elbow? Uh, or is it in my mouth? Also, am I holding here? Am I still breathing through things? Um, so those are some things I would say to start looking at now. Um, to kind of start to imagine new rooms, other rooms uh, to play in. Yeah. Oh, Seth, uh, just one uh, quick thing. If um, we're getting a, one comment from a viewer, maybe if uh, with regards to the, the levels, could you just maybe turn on original sound because it's too, uh, they're saying it's a little soft. Oh, okay. sorry about that. Okay. okay, let's see how this is for you all. Hopefully, this is better. I can also turn the gain up a little bit maybe that helps i don't know uh hopefully this helps you all and this is better you can let me know in the comments if um you can hear better hear me better uh, i'm sure the cello is coming through just fine uh, so let's see we have a new question uh from our youtube audience uh would you ever but would you ever consider using carbon fiber instruments or bows heard that lewis and clark cellos and arcus bows are the gold standard for that you know, I, I've played on one of the Lewis and Clarks, just a colleague's uh, instrument, and they're actually really great. I think if you, you get a great setup with a great bridge from, from a maker or a luthier um, to make your bridge for that and have it set up properly with the right strings, um, I, I would, well, I'm going to just go ahead and plug it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a Parastro artist for Parastro strings uh, for their perpetual edition. Those are amazing strings. That's what I've been playing on for the last three, four years. Um, they're amazing strings. They're super smooth. They're silvery in every single area. They're not, they're punchy, but not like in um, a rough and scrub area. But I think finding the right strings that are gonna really work for that instrument, um, I think they can be absolutely amazing. Of course, they are, they're perfect for those that are touring or doing, or if you're doing more work as a musician that where you may possibly have to be outside. Uh, it's a great instrument for multiple weathers. My instrument's quite old. Uh, so for those of you with older instruments, you know they can be very temperamental. Uh, so these are great instruments for that, but also for those that tour um, in a variety of different settings or do more outdoor um, concerts and events. Um, and then bows, of course, I think my very first bow before I was ever able to afford um, a Pernambuco bow or just a wooden bow, bass bow, um, I had a carbon fiber bow. I I think it was a Coda. I can't remember exactly, but there are some really great ones out there. I think, it, but I, I can't say which one. It, it, it's it's kind of like finding a, a hairstylist or a barber or whatever. Um, you got to find the one that really is gonna work for you, work for your instrument. Sometimes I find that the bow is even more important than the instrument in, in some ways because that is usually gonna be the main the main um, bedrock way in which you're gonna you're gonna make sound. So finding one that really fits for you that can do a lot of most of all the things that you need to for where you are right in this moment or in that moment in time um, so that would be my best advice for those of you on YouTube that are interested in that question or looking at um, the Lewis and Clark or Lewis and Clark styled um, cellos because there's quite a few different ones now outside of just the, the brand of Lewis and Clark 
Um, yeah, so I hope that, that helps. But they're great instruments. I definitely sign off on them. I have so many colleagues and friends that have them as like secondary. I even know a few people in the New York City Ballet and Chicago Symphony, um, Philadelphia Orchestra that have them as secondary instruments, especially those that are kind of playing in opera or ballet pits. They have them there because it's sometimes going to be so cramped and you don't want maybe bring your, your good, good instrument. <laughs> so you bring the other one that actually still sounds really good. Um, yeah. Uh, from Emily Peters, hello. Um, could you give us tips on how to play freely within the meter of the music and at times mess with the tempo, like taking extra time here and there? Okay, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, a perfect example of this. So, I mean, there's many th things. I think it depends on, well, it doesn't really depend on um, period and time. I think the first thing is understanding structure. So the overall musical harmonic structure, li lights and darks, um, uh, also kind of where there's tension and release um, inside of the music, especially in the harmony and in the rhythm, how that's built in, in into that. Understanding that very clearly with a metronome is a great first start. After that, internal, like whatever your, your overall kind of uh, tempo, your main tempo is, is for the work, have that very much so internalized inside of you so that at any moment in time you can snap into that thing and then within that, then start taking a few bars, like understand, okay, am I doing two bar phrases? Am I doing four bar phrases? Am I doing one bar phrases? Sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six. And where's the apex within all of that? And then I'm going beyond that. Okay, maybe I can push this here. And then within the score, sometimes it's a situation where you can, you can push just a little bit. Maybe it's not meant to be like um, beat, 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 but so something a good example here in, in my my interpretation with the Bach in the um, in the Aleman G major <laughs> Within that, you see, I understand the harmony ex well enough to know that I have a, a specific pulse that I can, I found a way through playing, through in the idea, not playing, but experimenting, trying things out of like, where can I push, where, what needs to really lock in uh, within, within the structure, especially within the phrase pattern that I'm looking, that I'm kind of putting everything inside of. And of course, that's going to alter from time to time or from year to year, depending on how long I've been playing said work. Um, and then I can try to push certain things, but you always want it to feel as if you can snap back in um, into something. So I think start out learning the structure, not if, if you're playing with other people and it's like a, a cello piano um, duo, I would really understand both your part and also understand the piano part, really understand the full structure, where the cello fits in, where the piano fits in, to how they fit together, where you can find ways to kind of cheat time a little bit, or I want to push a little bit here. Really great recordings uh, I learned long ago um, when I was first studying the Rachmaninoff cello sonata, um, was listening to my um, old mentor, Ursula Oppen's famed pianist. Um, she was saying, you should listen to Rachmaninoff actually playing the piano works. And it just how he takes time, where he takes time, and if it, is the time because of tempi or kind of um, intention, directionality of where we think we're going, we're arriving, but or we're trying to turn the corner on a phrase, or is it, uh, or is it because of harmonic structure as well? So certain things lend themselves to having a, a, a bit of an ebb and flow, and not necessarily always da 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 da. Which is why I always tell people when they're Early on, I think we have to listen to recordings um, to kind of start to get an idea, especially if they're older works or sometimes newer works, and we get an understanding of like what what's actually happening here. But to understand essentially roughly what people have been doing as far as a performance practice for, but I don't say I don't 
recommend people to copy or mimic because we don't actually know why they took the time there, why they took the time there, why they decided to accentuate things here. Some Eventually, I think we start to get to that point as you become a more advanced player and you understand more about your own instrument, how you can your own playing, and then just also musicality and developing a wider palette for that. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, and kind of can keep guiding you, but I think the first and foremost thing to do is to understand the structure, have your own structure built out. So if you're looking at two bar phrases, four bar phrases, okay, where's the apex within that? Where can I move time a little bit that helps get me in that direction? And it's not, that doesn't mean to rush, but that's more so to kind of phrase to a, a, a point, an arrival point, whether that's a minor arrival point or a major arrival point. Um, and then trying to make sure you have your overall pulse kind of running through you, whatever that may be, you know. Um, and that may be different from what's on the page, like the overall idea there. And so you're thinking of it in two, you're thinking of it in four, or you have something else that's in there, especially if you have a mixed meter time, how you kind of devise those things and where you can kind of finagle through it. So it, it takes some time um, to kind of start to figure it out. Um, but yeah. Um, let's see, where are we? I'm behind. I'm behind. Okay, Stephanie Mora, hello. Uh, could you share more about the Chosen Vale International Cello Seminar? Is it in person or virtual? Okay, great question. Um, so I run the uh, Chosen Vale International Cello um, Seminar, which normally takes place, uh, <laughs> Chosen Vale altogether takes place in Enfield, New Hampshire, which is very close to Dartmouth and the up, Dartmouth College in the Upper Valley. This year, because we lost last year, like most of everybody. Uh, we really wanted to try to do something different. So we're going to be virtual this year, uh, but we're going to only do it for one week from July 12th through the 18th. Um, and it's super, we cut the tuition way down to $650 per participant. There's still six faculty that are coming that are representing both classical, Baroque, and contemporary music. So you get a chance to study with all of them or as many as you want. And so there's two teachers teaching each day with master classes and lessons every day. Uh, and then there's workshops as well, especially on, on wellness and stretching and kind of tension um, and injury prevention as well. Uh, so it's a great, I'm proud of the group that we have put together and um, you guys should definitely check it out. Um, there's still some spots available. Um, so hopefully Stephanie, that helps. Um, helps you for this year at least will be will be virtual just so we kind of continue the the um, keep going with the community. I know there are quite a few different festivals that are that are that are that are here that are kind of still going. I'm serving on a few of those faculties as well. Um, but for Chosen Bell, yeah, that is mine, and um, I'm very happy that we're still trying to kind of keep going. So for those of you that are still looking for whether you're in high school or through college or um, graduate or finishing up in some or you're pre-professional already out there um, freelance etc um, and you would like an intensive or just a way to kind of work with a, a wide variety of players some from um, from the Chicago Symphony from 8th Blackbird from Longy School Boston Conservatory uh, some a few cellists that are coming from Canada as well um, definitely uh, check out Chosen Veil vale. um, we'd love to have you uh, let's see and you can also write me um, from my website, staffparkerwoods.com. You can write me there if you have further questions or have anything um, to ask about audition process or application process or scholarships or anything of that sort. Um, it's an open door <laughs> for me, so feel free. Amari um, Pollo. Uh, Gabello. Okay. Hi. Hello from Spain. Hi. How are you? Do you have any personal insights and tips for the Elgar Concerto? Thank you very much. Um, phrase structure. Phrase structure is a big one here. Um, I guess if we go back to the same idea I was talking about with regard to um, listening to old recordings, kind of seminal, iconic, uh, popular recordings from a wide few different cellists that we, of course, all know. Um, I think it's great to have those there. Um, I think the bigger part is to not find a way to mimic, um, to mimic them too much, but find a sense of novel, a sense of novelness um, that is inside, especially in the first movement, and even in the in the first few chords, and then going into the the initial um, kind of mourning, almost like canter-like melody. 
So this whole part here, really understanding metrically the rhythm with what's what's there. So you, in the idea, same idea we talked about cheating time or playing. If you really feel as if you want to move it in a slightly different way, understanding what the initial rhythm actually is, because um, far too many times I do hear um, younger cellists or just cellists in general. There's an obscureness that 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 actually happens there, and sometimes it's because there hasn't been a, a strong enough core um, understanding of the rhythm there. So, and the rhythm is there in a way to kind of help guide the musicality and kind of direction um, for the work. So don't get too caught up in it, but really having a, a core, a true strong core understanding of what that is. Um, and the idea that I talked about earlier, especially in the uh, in the last in the last movement, just when or even in the, the was it second movement, um, we talk about practicing, I guess, way I guess much much more slowly, um, with a certain weight as you're as you're playing, but also looking at it, how can I start to lighten this up over time, lighten up the movement either in the left hand or the right hand, so that it actually moves with more freedom. So you, especially in that movement, you don't want to feel like you're majorly weighed down, but you want to feel like you can in some way fly, but still have, you know, you still have, <laughs> you have a cable that's, that's grounding you down to the ground in a way, so you're not going to just like poof, float away. Um, so making sure, I think that's, that's one of the, um, the main things I can kind of impart onto you that, that doesn't necessarily get directly in the way of, of technique a lot of times also just sing sing the lines as well to make sure what you're hearing in your head and if hopefully that's the thing you want you, you're wanting it to sound like uh, or work at that also to make sure what you're hearing in your head is also what you're trying to play is what you can play on the actual instrument and how you getting them to be able to match in a way um, so all the times I still sing through a lot of parts to make sure that um, what's in my head and what's coming out of my original instrument, the mouth, the, vo the voice, uh, I can get that to match, you know, what's here on the instrument uh, and making sure they work together in that way so they're not kind of in two different worlds. I find sometimes I gave a master class recently a few days ago and I asked a few of the players to just to sing the parts and notice that what they were singing was completely different um, than what they were playing. And so that tells me they're, they're still not, there's still work to do. So cluing yourself in exactly what it is in your head you, you, have, um, you have to say. And then how do I get that out of here and into here, into the body and onto the instrument and then out to the audience. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. What are your most memorable moments on stage from Carter Jung? Um, good question. Oh, wow. Um, Hmm. I think the earliest, I, if I go back to the earliest, which is a very memorable moment, was um, I must have been maybe 10 or 11 years old and I played a cello duet with my first, first uh, teacher, um, Martin Clancy. I grew up in, in, in Houston um, and at the time he, he was teaching there. Um, and it was my first, like, big public like public performance it was actually for the graduation at that time and um i was <laughs> so nervous <laughs> you know leading up to it and i just remember him just grabbing my head like you know you get one shot but you know you gotta make it your best but also make, more than anything make sure you have fun have fun have fun and don't forget to smile <laughs> and so i will always remember that and that that kind of memory always comes back to me as one that I keep replaying that, especially if I get nervous about a big performance or something or a big event that's coming up. Um, I always fall back to those, those that that one memory. Other, I guess, more professional memories. Um, I remember playing the um, the Heinz Holliger. Heinz Holliger is a famed composer, but also famed uh, oboist. Um, Swiss, he's Swiss from Switzerland, and playing his cello concerto with him at the Kaka Öl in Luzern. Um, Switzerland and that was um, that was truly magical the hall itself you just felt like it just kind of <laughs> you were sitting like on a 
like an acoustically treated box that was just like wrapping you in your sound but also pushing it out to the audience at the same time so you felt like i felt like i could hear every part of the orchestra and myself at the same time which is not always the case and it felt so balanced and the acoustics were just they were really amazing and it was like uh Hologa and i were just in sync the entire time and that was that was a really beautiful performance where i just felt like um i was just sailing and i was just really really truly telling the story and of course not everything was perfect about the performance i mean is there really ever a truly truly perfect performance but i felt like i was most myself in that moment i think another one was probably my very last recital i gave in march of 2020 march 3rd <laughs> burned into my head march 3rd 2020 uh, with my duo partner andrew uh, we uh, played this big recital in chicago um, and we were also in that program, we were doing the, um, the George Walker cello sonata and you know, that sonata is a death trap in certain, <laughs> in certain ways. And I felt in this moment in time, we like, and we played it quite a few times at this point, but I felt like that was a moment where it just, it just worked and it, everything was just going, going, going. The characters were there. I knew exactly what was going on and Andrew and I were so in sync in a way that it just felt electric on the stage that you just, almost like a deer in headlights. You wanted to look away, but you couldn't look away in a great way, I, I mean to say it in this way. Uh, so it was just, it was it was electric, it was a lot of fire, it was really exciting um, to be there and to be doing that performance. Um, other, I guess, moments on stage outside of classical music um, was I was touring with uh, Peter Gabriel um, doing a world tour with him and we had come to uh, Montreal to the Bell Center to perform and it was after the first half and they I think that the lights had gone down we were on a stage that of course that turned so Peter's like really into lighting and visual spectacle and the lights went out and then all of a sudden the crowd just started slowly like like slowly chanting, 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 Pina, Pina, Pina. And then before it became so much like, in the Bell Center, like it's, it's where they play uh, the hockey. <laughs> this is a huge place. And it just felt like, like literally my instrument started to vibrate, like everything was shaking and vibrating. I mean, it was, it was again, electric is probably the <laughs> easiest way for me to say it. And I had never, I, I never felt anything like this in my life. I wish more classical concerts were actually like this. <laughs> uh, for like, to really show appreciation. It, it was it was just really amazing to kind of be in that moment in time with um, with my colleagues on the stage. And we were all just looking at each other like, do you feel that? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, we just had a, such a great time. So I think that was, that will always kind of, for me, go down as a hugely memorable, um, moment in time as far as as a, as a performer regardless of, of musical genre yeah just to see the love and infectious energy coming from the audience as um as as they kind of pouring it back into the artists into the musicians and performers on on the stage and um i truly miss that and miss kind of sharing i think we all do miss sharing those sharing space sharing space with others in that way and being able to create and express and tell our stories and I can't wait to get back to that as things start to roll out and hopefully things will, or they're starting to get a little bit better, but of course we're seeing spikes and peaks in different parts of the country and world. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to more in-person um, sharing, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, James Dowell, how do you work on sight reading? And by sight reading, I mean reading contemporary works with tricky rhythms and notes. <laughs> Okay, here's one. Get your red pencil out. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing I always do, even if you're sight reading it, I always want to get an idea of the, the rough, rough structure, like where my beat patterns are, even if I'm just going to put in the beats. I'm going to put them in just little little red ticks. I learned this back in my undergrad um, from Charles Nydick, the famed clarinetist and pedagogue. Um, I was working with him on, like, I think, Peter Maxwell Davies is like eight songs for Matt King and it's just the rhythms are all over the place and there's extended techniques and things like that. So I just started putting tick marks in there and um, 
And then I was just, and then he's like, you know, you, did, you have to sing it. You know, don't try to, there's too much already in the way of just trying to like play it, play it. So I would sing, I would sing the rhythms, just get the rhythms out. And I would take, you know, measure by measure or a few measures and just try to kind of keep my eye ahead. Not necessarily always write, right on it, but see what's coming before. And so it, it, after a while, I think you start to understand kind of rhythmic, rhythmic notation in a way that you can kind of truncate certain things in a way that you can kind of, you can guess ahead, like this is gonna fall like this, this 32nd is gonna fall in this place, and that's, that's followed by maybe an eighth rest or something like that. Um, so I think singing a lot of things, if you're already in school studying, you're out of school studying, just going back to your ear training studies in that way um, before even trying to put it on the instrument. But I think when you start to get to transferring it in that way, applying the same the same idea, certain techniques that might, might get in the way, but finding ways to kind of keep going and keeping a sense of pulse in a way and not trying to do it at tempo because I think there's so few people that actually can do that. Um, so trying to take a, a slow and comfortable, mostly emphasis on comfortable tempo um, that will allow you to kind of move through in a methodical way um, that where you're not gonna necessarily always fall over yourself in it. Um, and then where something trips you up, I will put a little, little asterisk or something. So I need to come back to that to focus on maybe just that beat or half a beat or whole measure. Uh, it's something that I know that's definitely going to um, need some work. Um, so those are some of the things that I definitely just have red pencils or just just your regular like um, regular pencil, but just making a little tick where the actual beats um, fall in the work and um, start really start looking at them in that way and trying to sing them and understand exactly what's happening here um, and what may trip you up if, if there's also patterns if there's patterns that look a little bit more obscure in the writing or if this could be rewritten in this way um, and that helps me a lot actually um, yeah I hope that helps there's a lot of course there's a lot more techniques that can go into it and I wish I could talk even more about this especially when it it comes to contemporary works, but also in classical works as well. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of moments where things can really uh, trip you up, um, especially if you're reading reading things down. So I think um, singing is the first big thing here. Um, understanding the structure, just doing an over a quick overview where there may be hard moments, and that necessarily doesn't mean like really um, condensed areas of a lot of black, a lot of a lot of notes and things, but look for the more sparse areas as well. I, I sometimes love to kind of like zero in on those sections. Okay, I'm gonna start read this to that. Okay, what does that look like? And that's not necessarily about uh, me getting the notes, but let, maybe I'm just on an open string, just So I'm just, I'm not necessarily worrying about the pitches, but more so just trying to get the rhythm to understand exactly what this is. And then I'll go back through and then I'll start to add the actual, if I can, the actual pitch content material to kind of give me a better, now a more um, direct idea of what it actually sounds like. But one, you need to get the kind of the skeletal structure of what you're gonna be working with first and foremost. So those are two things I, I, I love to do and I still do, I'm doing it right now as I'm working on some new uh, works for some graduate students from Stanford. Um, let's see, from Joseph Reagan, we hear about feeling weight in terms of the bow, but do you ever think about the weight of the left hand and how do you describe it to a student? Oh my God, yeah, okay, so I was literally just uh, going over this with a student uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, especially when we talk about, um, yeah, there's so much, well, either there's a neglect in this way of the right hand in certain teaching or certain teachers talk about certain things about the bow in, in sometimes loose terms, sometimes very developed ways, or um, but also in the left hand, as we talk about the way, where is it actually coming from? Is it in the finger, especially when you go into thumb position? How do we put the weight in there? One, for, for anchoring, for control, um, but also for freedom, uh, but also uh, as, as we move in and out, move from one note to the other. So a lot of things I love doing up front, the, one of the first exercises I do most days, or most days, um, is looking at really slow vibrato in, in the lower positions and also in the higher positions. Um, but when I'm back here, even if I'm up here, it's like, where? how does this fall? Do I always have to feel as if everything is up? And always, am I moving in this kind of direction? Like, am I moving with the string? Um, so I practice the same material in kind of different 
kind of quadrants and what does it feel like to have it like right by the right by the, the side of the body like can you move in certain ways are we moving with the thumb and I tend to either remove the thumb so you really can start to feel like the thumb almost feels like an anchor down to pull the arm down and then what does that feel like as I'm moving material from one finger to the next um, and kind of oscillating between those things and does one work better than the other one does do you feel more free or feel more constriction if so let's make the adjustments for that especially when you start to add the vibrato so that you have more freedom and control with the with the sound but also with the weight um, so definitely try the same thing out in different different areas obviously this is not going to always work for you in all, all situations um, so those are some of the things that I do think about when it comes to the left hand, especially when um, I have we have some material that's up in the higher registers, especially on long sustained or even some more fast moving passages, how much weight needs to be added here sometimes as it pertains to sound as well, sound production moving within a phrase, uh, sometimes there's not enough pressure added, not necessarily to the whole hand, but directly um, um, well, directed uh, towards a specific finger. So this is like one of the areas that I really love talking about is how can you create those balances where everything else is still is much it has much more freedom or is fully you know as free as it possibly can be within a, a given position or a shape. And while you put the um, you put the weight in that specific finger or those specific fingers, whatever it may be. So you still have a form of anchor that's actually happening, but you're not grounding down too much that you start to um, create paralysis in the hand, especially in the, in the upper thumb positions. But sometimes you want it to be um, so fluid um, that you do need some of the weight or you need weight and then no weight, weight, no weight. So not every single note needs to have the same type of weight along the way. Um, I think that was Heinz that was telling me that long years ago in Switzerland that you know they don't all have the same um, the same emphasis even though they're in the same kind of phrase structure so figuring out like we talk about lights and darks the same thing when we think about weight here so sometimes it's the uh, in, a, in a given a given phrase like the so sometimes as I'm coming back going when I, the, the initial shift, the first C to the B flat, um, there's weight here, but I release up. So you can either do, well, when we talk about, well, shifts is a whole other thing. But when I'm going up and I get the B flat, there isn't so much weight on the very first, the first arrival to the B flat, but then I add it there for, to kind of focus the sound, but also to give it direction in my perspective, to give it actual direction. And then as I'm coming down, all of these notes, most of them, except for the E, because that's kind of a connective tissue to the lower positions, I add a little bit of weight there and then guide back. So weight here. So I'm making sure I'm not suspended too much. that same idea is so I think that is kind of micro work and then in the the larger context being able to put it together but understanding where you need to put what weight needs to go on which fingers and I think that is just slow process work sometimes out of context and then in context do you still feel it so you almost feel as if you're going through a choreography you're kind of you're painting a choreo, uh, choreographic score that kind of goes juxtaposed on top of it so looking at different Ways of then down. What gets changed by the different positionings um, as you shift through them? So and then learning from yourself. So then you're teaching yourself in this way. You're creating a, a pedagogical practice for yourself that's away from your teacher. Because I always say, the practicing of the student is the eighty percent, and I am the twenty percent in the lesson. <laughs> So, you know, so there's a lot of things you have to teach yourself. There's fundamentals and things we can give you as teachers, but other times uh, you need to be able to to work on your own. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh...
Jamie Kim over the course. Hi, Paul. Um, Jamie Kim, over the course of your life, what artists have most inspired you and in what ways did they influence your artistry? Um, that, that is wide and varying. Um, and it's not only in class, in, well, in music. Um, a lot of that is also in the art world as well. I spent a lot of time going to galleries, um, going to ballets and seeing different different forms of expression. Um, of course, Jacqueline Dupre was kind of one of the very first, the very first tape or CD I ever had uh, came from my teacher, David Garrett, who's with the um, Los Angeles Philharmonic now, but that was a tape of the 12 cellos of the Berlin Phil. <laughs> and I really loved it. This is when people were making mixtapes uh, for people, true mixtapes. And uh, so I really loved being able to hear and see a wide variety of where the cello could go and what it could be and different types of playing. Um, so that still sticks in my head as, as a deep memory. Uh, a lot of, I got, grew up with a lot of jazz music, a lot of soul music. And so a lot of those artists, Shaka Khan and Tina Turner, just being able to use the voice and being able to sonically express in such a way was just so exciting for me. Um, and then um, many years later, I got a CD of Heinrich Schiff and I was fortunate enough to get to work with him before he passed. And for me uh, also, I feel like some ways an, a very underrated uh, musician and human um, in some, some circles or just didn't write to the echelons of, for some, some people. But for me, he was very much so a, a big, um, a huge inspiration in, in playing the cello and in different ways and seeing sonically what you could do and where you could take the cello. For, for me, he was a, a big one. So he's one that still kind of stands out. And Andrei Milianov, he's still a, a big one uh, for me, not, not that he has passed, but he still was, he's always been a big inspiration. And um, you should definitely go listen to recordings of him. I'm running out of time, I'm so sorry. This always goes so fast. Um, how does uh, performance practice um, of each genre of music influence your cello technique when performing? Okay, so I find ways of really looking at bare bones, bare bones, regardless of we're talking about extended techniques, there are certain things that come from the bedrock of the playing that have to innately be there that are going to allow you to sail. Sail in, in the way of being able to kind of maneuver between different worlds. I always find, I think it's very important for people to have a wide arsenal of, um, of expression, of different types of techniques, um, and being able to do it in different ways and not just like, okay, this is the way I've learned, this is the way that works, but how can I continue to break that down and do something more, do something more each time, uh, and find find more weakness or find areas that I feel like, oh, this could be even better here, so how can I create the same? Uh, if I can just oscillating, I was doing this earlier today, could I oscillate between two notes here and then just, or do thirds and just oscillating between them over two strings and make the same exact sound out here. It's really hard to do it up here. And then, okay, it's not gonna only work with just the fingers or with the wrist. I'm gonna have to start to move from just fingers and wrists to actually moving more of the elbow as the bigger muscle or bigger, um, well, um, arm group here to actually help me be able to get that thing while still pronating and using the fourth finger as an anchoring tool so you're balanced across the board the whole time. Um, so I try to employ those same those same ideas and when I'm playing or I'm improvising with certain things and I, then I bring that to the Brahms, I bring that to the Bach, uh, I bring that to Helmut Lachmann and, and, and so on and so on, like a lot of contemporary works as well. Um, and try to find ways across the board where they match or this thing that's in this contemporary work is very similar. This same type of shift that I'm doing here, maybe different um, different pitch material is the exact, it has the exact same sen physical sensation, the exact same um, like physical trajectory. So if that works for that, then that should work for this, right? So then it's an isolation of the two. So I, I learn a lot more from, from both sides of them. I can bring out new types of colors. How can I control the bow in different ways, oscillating between flat hair, half hair, um, and making them all work for themselves. So a lot of part, a big part of it for me is just playing, the idea in quotations, You're experimenting with things and trying to keep it fresh and not institutional and not stack it in in a way that what I call like institutionalized playing in a, in a situation where it gets so crippled by one specific way of doing it that you don't move beyond that. So always for me, I always 
have said, and I keep trying to stick to this, is to make sure that I am staying as free as possible in my playing and that the interpretations always can find a way to still feel fresh. I'm just constantly searching for something new and something different that I can bring forth. Yeah. Um, James Hayes, how has your perspective as a musician and artist changed throughout your career? Um, that kind of ties into the thing before I was saying. Um, it's grown in, in interesting ways and there are things that I do now that I didn't, um, or opportunities that I, I've had uh, that I didn't expect um, to, to be doing. You know, I didn't know that I would, you know, if I stayed open enough and our app, or that I would be interested in curating or curating for other people or programming or working with symphonies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, I just try to stay open as possible and do as much as I possibly can. Um, and grow in the best possible ways um, and not feel like if the thing that I started out doing at five, six years old and that I decided, oh, this becomes my career, that I'm not going to, you know, that will be the only thing I ever do, but how can I stay um, open and hungry and continue to search um, for new ways to be, to be and exist in the world? How can I bring myself to new heights? Can I, can I bring the cello to new heights and, and, and bring it into new rooms and spaces? Um, and that's not necessarily physical spaces, that could be also virtual spaces <laughs> as well. And what, and how can I envision that? And how can I work with other people to do that? Um, and it's been, um, it's been amazing. So I think the main thing I keep telling people is to write your career in pencil. And I kind of stuck to that idea um, to make sure that what you're doing, what you set your sights on, isn't limiting you in a way, but it's allowing you to stay, um, to, to grow and allowing you to keep searching um, as you go along this journey of yours. Because there's no one way to be a cellist and there's no one way to play the music. There are practices and the practices can be broken as long as I think you are justifying yourself in the interpretations um, and it's still, you understand where it's coming from. You're not inventing the wheel, but you're just adding a new lens to what that which you are interpreting. So, um, and that goes for the music, but that also goes for your life, <laughs> your career. Uh, so stay open, uh, understand the histories uh, and how you can grow from them. Your uh, past histories and present histories, as I like to say. So thank you all again. This was absolutely a blast. Hi again from New York. Happy spring. Happy Easter to those that are celebrating. Uh, this is a blast again. Thank you, Paul and Cello Bello, for having me again. It's always um, a joy. <laughs> uh, and all the panelists, everyone that, that's actually asked a question today. So I will see you all again. Again, Chosen Veil still has a few um, spots open, so definitely check it out, chosenveil.org. Um, and take care, take care of yourselves, take care of the people around you, and we will see you all soon in some space near you.